my friend and colleague, the Reverend Eileen Wiviet, serves the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Evanston, Illinois, which is right on the northern edge of Chicago, close enough that people who live there say they're from Chicago. <laughs> Evanston is one of the handful, I mean the bare handful, of cities in this country actively working on reparations. Aline shared this story last fall. She told me as a seminarian. As a seminarian, I was asked to preach several times during the summer of 2015. I had just read the ta Coates article, The Case for Reparations, and I was eager, though a little nervous, to preach about it in Door County, Wisconsin. I wasn't sure how racial justice and reparations would be received in this small northern Wisconsin vacation town. Also, my mom was coming with me, and I wasn't sure how she would receive it. <laughs> my mom and stepdad, conservative Catholics, have an RV parked in a campground in Door County. So she and I drove up together that August. And in this small sanctuary of mostly white looking folks, an African American family walked in and sat down just before the service started. I read parts of the story of Clyde Ross, who lived in the North Lawndale neighborhood of Chicago, and preached a message calling for an examination of the use and misuse of white power and privilege. Eileen says, after the service, an older African-American man came up to me and expressed his gratitude for the sermon. He was from All Souls Free Religious Fellowship, a, a congregation, UU congregation, on Chicago's South Side. And he shared his involvement in the work to integrate housing in Oak Park, western edge of Chicago in the 60s, 70s. And as we were talking, my mom walked up tearful and shared her story, which I did not remember hearing before. When she was 16 years old, in 1958, a real estate agent came to the house she had lived in for most of her life with her parents and her grandparents in Arthington Street, the northern border of North Lawdale. The realtor came to the door and said to her family, you better sell now, because they are coming. Meaning African Americans coming across the invisible barrier of race in Chicago, Roosevelt Road, moving into the white neighborhood. If they wanted to get anything of value out of their house, the agent warned they better sell it now. My mom said within a week, everyone on the block sold their house. My grandparents, Eileen says, my grandparents, first generation Italian Americans, moved to Norwich, a white enclave suburb within the northwest corner of the city, set up as a destination for white flight. A generation before that, my Italian grandparents were not considered white. I was stunned and embarrassed Stunned and embarrassed as I watched this black man comforting my weeping mom, saying, it wasn't your fault. You were 16. What, what are you going to do? My mom's guilt eased. And I was left thinking about the implications of my family history in the case for reparations. Sometimes, I think, sometimes the way the conversation about reparations unfolds, sometimes the way that conversation goes, even among well-meaning white folks, really boils down to how much will it cost for me not to be ashamed of the past? And for some folks, that shame is so powerful, so profound, there will never be a price tag big enough not to feel badly. And for some folks, there's no shame about the past at all, and reparations of any kind just seem ridiculous. White 
guilt and fear and ignorance all seem to agree that the conversation about reparations, the most important part of it, the essential part of it, the real part of it boils down to how much is enough and to whom. But that's not actually where the work begins. The work begins most importantly by asking, what happened? What happened? A call to reparations begins with telling the truth about the ways that the past is still alive in the present, still shaping the present. In 2014, ta Coates writes this monumental cover story for the Atlantic magazine, The Case for Reparations. And of this story, almost none of it whatsoever is a philosophical argument for why one would give reparations of some kind or to whom. Almost none of that article is at all a, a program of how to go about doing it. Instead, instead, most of the article is an analysis of how the past is still deeply alive inside of the present. That the legacies of federal programs and on the ground racism in housing discrimination demolished the possibility of generational wealth and opportunities in ways that still shape this very moment right now. The past is alive in the present, and the first work is the curiosity to wonder about that reality. Let me give you one example. Let's follow that thread in one place. In 2012, Wells Fargo settles a housing discrimination lawsuit for over $175 million. The bank had known that the loans they were making to African Americans could not be repaid, but made the loans anyways and obfuscated, obscured the reality of what they were. Why did that suit happen? Well, because in 2009, half of the minority-owned homes that Wells had made subprime mortgages to, and three quarters of those were in black neighborhoods, half of them were vacant. Half of them had already gone belly up. Why was that happening in 2009? Well, in 2005, Wells Fargo actively targeted black communities with subprime loans. They had a unit specifically working with black churches to reach people who wanted to borrow. All right, but, but why were they doing that in 2005? They were pitching home ownership as a way to build generational wealth that black families had been excluded from. They made subprime loans, loans with much higher interest rates to people in segregated communities, but why target those communities? Well, because these are the same people who have been historically excluded from mainstream banking. And the roots of that, the roots of that go back through the 20th century when federal housing policy prevented black people from accessing home loans. This is not a hidden conspiracy. This was the explicit policy of the Federal Housing Administration. During the Depression in the 1930s, the Federal Housing Administration was not created to lift the nation out of poverty through home ownership. The Federal Housing Administration was created to lift white America out of poverty through home ownership. It was the FHA which insisted on restrictive covenants. You couldn't, if you were a white person, sell your house to a black person. It was the FHA which insisted on redlining the lending standards that said they could not make a loan to a person living in a black neighborhood. Why? Why were they doing that in the 30s? Well, they're doing this in the 30s because in the 1910s, the first great migration, a million black Americans move out of the South and into the North. And the racism of Northerners wants to see segregation continue 
in the North. There is no mythic past in which the North was not a racist place to be. Why did that great migration happen in the 1910s? Because the Jim Crow South didn't just mandate segregation as if we will politely have this water fountain and you will politely have that one. They enforced it through terror and murder and extortion. Why was that happening in the Jim Crow South? Well, because Reconstruction reconstructed the South for white people, not for the formerly enslaved. Y'all, this is hard to follow the thread. And I don't know if you can feel this online, but in the room, the energy is just slowly draining away as this becomes harder to hear and stick with. But the point is, the point of all of that is that the past is alive in the present. Wells Fargo went to work in the 2000s, stealing money from black Americans under the promise of building generational wealth. And the reason that promise was bright and attractive and seductive was because of generations, generations of history and exclusion, the past still alive in the present. A week ago Thursday, Colorado Senate Bill 53 cleared its first committee at the Capitol. Under this proposed bill, one reporter explains, a commission would be appointed to conduct an exhaustive racial equity study an undertaking that would take two years and the final product would lay out the ways slavery touched Colorado. And it would chart the present day impacts of racism in everything from healthcare and education to housing and policing. The bill says that the history of slavery and discrimination has harmed black Coloradans in material ways, even though we are perceived, the story white Colorado mostly tells itself is that we didn't really participate in slavery. That wasn't really a thing here. But the legacy of discrimination absolutely persists throughout our whole history, including the role of the Ku Klux Klan in state and local government in the 20s. The city was run by the KKK in the 20s. Once complete, the commission of lawmakers and historians and experts present the study to the legislature and various entities. It was maybe unsurprisingly in this present moment a party line vote. And Senator Larry Liston from Colorado Springs who voted against said his big concern was that the report could set the groundwork for a push for reparations. And I quote, personally speaking, I am against reparations for anybody anybody for any reason. Unfortunately, there were injustices that were done 150 years ago. We've tried to address them. Is everything perfect today? I don't know. <laughs> he probably said it less sarcastically. <laughs> what, what he's saying though, what, what that is, what he's saying is the past is unrelated to the present. He's saying this horrible thing happened. That's progress. This horrible thing happened, but it doesn't have anything to do with us. I think also though, in, in that refusal of curiosity, right, the refusal of the possibility of learning something there, I think underneath that is also the belief or maybe the fear that if we knew what our history really was, if we knew how it still shaped the present, we would feel obliged to do something to make that right. Rabbi Dana Rutenberg writes about repair, about reparation, about repentance. She says that work all the way through is the work of transformation. It's the work of facing down false stories and engaging with the painful reality. It's the work of being open to seeing ourselves as we really are. 
of understanding that other people's needs and pain are at least as important as our own. It's about figuring out how to be the kind of person who sees other people's suffering and takes responsibility for any role we may have had in causing it. It's about ownership, owning who we've been and what we've done, and also owning the person, the state, the nation, that we are capable of becoming. The spiritual task for us in that work is curiosity, yes, and empathy, and humility. Curiosity explores, and empathy builds the bridge, but it's humility that lets us engage this question without shame. Now, I know humility is sometimes used like a weapon, and people say, you should be more humble, and what they really mean is, I hate you and you're terrible. Right? <laughs> humility is used like a weapon. You should be more humble means you should think you're bad. Uh, no, 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 this is not what, I'm throwing all of that out. None of that's welcome here. Humility, what it really means, what it really means is temperance. It means balance. It means letting go of being the hero. It also means letting go of being the villain. It means letting go of being perfectly pure. You aren't, you're not going to be. It also means letting go of being terribly tarnished. You're bad and broken and can't be fixed. None of that. Humility is the path through the middle of that thing. And it's always required when we go about changing the story of who we are. That's the work. Coates, Tanasi Coates says, reparations is a revolution of an American consciousness. It's a reconciling of our self-image as the great democratizer with the facts of our history. Both of those, we can let go of the myth that we ourselves don't benefit from enslavement and its legacy. We can let go of the myth that we white folks got opportunities from being white we wouldn't have had if we weren't. We can let go, most of all, of this myth, persistent, that the past has nothing to do with the present. The reality is this is already happening. And our children and grandchildren will know these facts and face them and tell the story of this country in its full beauty and horror. They will tell the whole truth. We don't have to wait for them to do it, to keep moving forward. With curiosity and empathy and humility, let's begin. <laughs>